48 hours in fear of water. Let me introduce you to my basement. I don't know how many inches of water we had over the past couple of days. My basement is not a nice basement. It is partially furnished several times. Why is that? because my basement was built 15 inches above the standing water table. This means that every time it rains a certain amount, the water table rises. If you have a basement, then you understand what this means. I have added sub pumps, I have added waterproof molding. I have installed a partial tile system. I still have nightmares every time it rains. I am right now breathing a sigh of relief because the rain has stopped. But that's never a guarantee because the water table continues to rise even after it stops raining. But at this point, I think I'm safe. My family is safe. My basement is safe. I was driving over here this evening, and I heard this weekend's forecast. I fear water again. <laughs> My basement may not be safe. I guess we will find out. The talk this evening is about water, and I've subtitled mythology, the natural world, the symbolism of water. But let me fill you in on the actual title, which was Names Writ in Water. I have actually borrowed that from the epitaph of the great romantic poet John Keats. You might be familiar with some of his work. If not, he's actually my favorite romantic poet. Um, John Keats's epitaph actually reads, Here lies one whose name was writ in water. What does that refer to? But John Keats was an ambitious man, and what he wanted most was to be remembered eternally for his contributions to poetry and the arts. He wanted to be poetically immortal. Unfortunately, John Keats died young, and it was a tragic tale. He, in fact, had a brother that he nursed through uh, horrible consumption. And when his brother died, within a year, he too began to show signs of the disease. And there is only one end to consumption. And knowing that he did not have much time left, he moved to Italy from England in order to spare his lungs with the supposedly cleaner, fresher air there. It would not help. Consumption is an ugly disease, and he often bemoaned the fact that he had so much poetry and so much imagination left to give the world that he could barely stand the thought that he would essentially be wiped off the earth without having contributed that to the standing basis of letters and poetry. And in fact, he often lamented that once I'm gone, my poetry shall follow. His name, he said, would be writ in water. He borrowed that line from a pre-existing play, and the line from that play was, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, but it's all your better deeds shall be in water writ, which seems to say that when everyone goes, they take everything with them. As it turns out, John Keats did not have to worry. He had been savaged by terrible reviews of his work up until close to his death. He had reason, I suppose, to be concerned. But his friends were immensely dedicated not only to him personally, but to his work. And they said they would ensure that it lived forever, particularly his very close friend, Percy Bysshe Shelley, another very well-known romantic poet. He did his best over the next year and a half to secure his friend's legacy after 
actor, John Keats, died in February of 1821. And a year and a half later, Percy Bysshe Shelley followed Keats. Only his grave was a watery one. He drowned. Therefore, names writ in water kind of echo when I think about water and when I think about stories and poetry. What does it mean to be written in water? It means that water is the element that is the most mutable of elements. What does that mean? It's constantly in motion. It's fluid. It changes. You cannot fix its form. A name written in water is bound to be erased by the natural movement of that substance. Therefore, it's kind of a cry, a plea not to be forgotten. John Keats was concerned with immortality. Oddly enough, water is often tied to concerns about mortality and immortality. Let's take a step back from Keats, a several thousand year step. One of my fascinations has always been with mythology. And interestingly enough, water runs through virtually every mythical system on this planet. Almost every culture has a mythical system that features water as what is sometimes called the primordial element. What is that? It's the primal substance. It exists before all others. In almost every mythical system, you have what is called a series of creation myths. They are cosmogonic, fancy, schmancy word. What does it mean? Explaining the cosmos and why and how it exists. Therefore, there is always a kind of a system of separation that occurs in these kinds of myths. Greek myths, Celtic myths, Norse myths, separation of elements is key. But the element that is always there first is some form of water. Even in the stories that we get in the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, we are told that there was nothing until God spoke and created it. And yet it also tells us that God's breath moved upon the face of the waters. But the Hebrew stories that become the Old Testament are not the earliest stories that we have. There are earlier stories than what we find in Greek myths or in Genesis, in the Hebrew stories. They go back even further. Let's go all the way back to one of my favorites, and it's where all of human story begins. The earliest story that we have a reference to is the story of a great Sumerian king. The Sumerian king list is actually a historical document inscribed in a writing that is called cuneiform on a clay tablet, and it's called the Sumerian king of, uh, list of kings. And on that list of kings is a name which has achieved immortality story. That name is Gilgamesh, or as we refer to him as Gilgamesh. The story is the epic of Gilgamesh, and it is the earliest recorded story of human history in any language that we have. Who is Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh was a Sumerian king. He was two-thirds god and one-third man. And he had a rather unpleasant tendency of lording it over his own well, his people responded to that. And they said, please, Sumerian gods and goddesses, do something about this man. He takes our women from us. He enslaves our men. We cannot control him. Please do something. And the gods get together. They have a conversation. And they say, what can we do to restrain this man? And one of the goddesses, a ruler says, let us send him a friend, a friend who can take his measure, a friend who can balance out his unpleasant tendencies. And she takes in one hand clay, and in the other hand, she pools some water. She combines the two things which have been separate, and in combining them, she creates a man. The man is named Enkidu. Who is Enkidu? 
Enkidu is a wild man. When he first appears, he runs with the animals. He drinks at the water hole with the herd, and he does not separate himself from them. He will separate himself from them when he is seduced by a priestess who lies with him for seven days and seven nights. And when he attempts to return to the water hole, they will not have him there. His wild hair must be cut, his beard must be trimmed, and he is now a civilized man. He goes to meet this one called Gilgamesh, and they take each other's measure in a wrestling bout. And what happens? They're people. You have the beginnings of the earliest literary bromance in human history. Gilgamesh and Enki together at last. And so, what do they proceed to do? They proceed to go on a series of adventures. Gilgamesh and Enkidu go to slay a giant. Gilgamesh and Enkidu go to subdue the natural world around them. Gilgamesh and Enkidu do many, many things. And after every single adventure, they engage in a bathing ritual. What does this mean? They wash themselves clean of the grime and the filth that they have accumulated from that week's adventure. And when they emerge from this ritual bathing, they are washed clean in both body and in spirit. You obviously can draw parallels with this to things like the Christian ritual of baptism, in which you are spiritually reborn or made anew. All of these references have to do with life and mortality. When Gilgamesh and Enkidu go just a little too far, when their adventures begin to take them to a height that the gods and goddesses cannot tolerate, they say, this far, no further. In other words, we must do something to quell their pride and their hubris. They achieve too much, and before you know it, they will be threatening us. What can we do about these two? We thought we would balance them out. We have instead increased the potential for disaster. They bring a sickness upon Enkidu and he wastes away and dies. It is odd, actually, that the details of his illness resemble that of consumption a bit. Gilgamesh watches helplessly as his friend perishes in front of him. And Gilgamesh goes nuts. In other words, he looks at his friend and says, I cannot abide the absence of my friend. He wails. He tears at his clothes and rips out his hair, which he allows to grow long and wild. He runs through the forest as a crazy man, and significantly enough, he stops bathing. He refuses to wash himself. As a result, he becomes dirtier and dirtier, perhaps in both body and spirit. Until one day he says, there must be an answer to this. Is someone as great as I condemned to this same fate to be nothing? And Gilgamesh says, it cannot be war. I must do something. I must find the secret to live forever. He will embark upon a journey which will take him far across the land to where the land ends and for him. Now, step back. If you go to the beach, you are actually visiting what many mythical stories refer to as a liminal place. What is a liminal place? The Celts would say it is where the veil grows thin. What veil are they talking about? The veil that separates this world from the next world. What they might call the other world with a capital. But it is not just the Celts who say these things. It is virtually every mythical system on Earth. The place where the Earth ends and the water begins is a mingling of two elements, that which is solid and unchanging, that which is fluid and constantly in motion. Formless it is constantly changing form. This is as far as Gilgamesh can go. 
but he has heard that beyond those waters, there is a special land, a special place which only someone special can get to. That place is the Isle of Immortality, and on it dwells a very special man. That man's name is Utnapishti. <laughs> Utnapishti dwells on the island of immortality. Who is Utnapishti? Utnapishti is a man that the gods have granted immortality because he did something great. Utnapishti is the survivor of a great flood. Tell me if you have heard this story before. Long ago, the gods said, People are annoying. Why is that? We make noise. We're loud. We won't shut up. We partake. And it keeps them up at night. We won't turn down the stereos. We won't close our mouths. We have annoying laughs. Whatever it may be, we're keeping the gods up. And the gods eventually lose it. They say, Wipe it clean. The Sumerian gods and goddesses share their ideas and suggest submerging the earth beneath the waters. It'll drown all the noisemakers. Then we can start over. I'd like to remind you, this story predates Hebrew stories by thousands of years. The Sumerians, of course, would tell a story like this because floods are disastrous for early civilizations. There's a reason why virtually every first civilization on Earth arose next to a river. What do rivers do? They create fertile land. The land on either side of rivers is amongst the best land that you can have to grow crops, to start fields, to generate produce to be able to survive in one place for a long period of time. Rivers also can take you places where people have things that you don't. Therefore, trade begins along rivers. You can trade over there, you can trade down there, the river will take you either direction, it will bring you what you need. But when rivers flood their banks, you're in big trouble. Flooding can be among the most disastrous of natural disasters. We know this today. They knew it then. And when the Sumerians had these stories about floods, who else but the gods could cause them? Well, this was the flood to end all floods. But one of the gods, Enki, decided on his own that this might be the wrong idea. And he chose a man who was blameless and who had always given to the gods. And he said, Utnapishti, gather your family together, get as many of the animals as you can, build yourself a boat, get into it, and wait it out. Utnapishti did. And he told him, build it to these dimensions. I told you you've heard this story before. Utnapishti gathered the animals that he could find, including birds who would eventually go out to scout the waters and look for emerging land. Utnapishti rode out the flood for 150 days, and then the flood waters receded, and yes, the earth could be renewed. Utnapishti and his family had saved what could be saved, and as a result, the gods repented of this thing that they had done, and they granted to Utnapishti immortality, <coughs> eternal life. They gave him his own place beyond the waters. This is mythical code for somewhere else other than here. In other words, does Utnapishti dwell in the world in which you and I live? No. But Gilgamesh is going there anyway. He gets as far as the shoreline, and he finds there a woman named Siduri. She is the guardian of the coast. She is also sometimes called the Ale Maiden. <laughs> and so, he says, I need a boat. She says, have a beer instead. 
He has the beer, and then he says, I still need a boat. And she says, why? Why do you want to do this? She said, you've got a lot right here. Why don't you stay? You don't want to try this. And Gilgamesh said, I must. I've, I've spent a lot to get it. And she says, fine, if you really are set on this. But I think it's a bad idea. There's this dude named Urshanabi. There will be a this later. Urshanabi has a boat. Urshanabi is the ferryman for crossing the water to Udnapishtim's Garden of Immortality. If that sounds familiar, you've heard that in Greek myths as well. One of the otherworldly lands in Greek myth, of course, is where the souls go when they die. But you got to cross one of the rivers to get there. And there's a ferryman named Charon. You give him some coinage, he ferries your soul across to the land of the dead. Urshadabi will do the same thing. Give him some money, he'll take you to that island but no one's ever been brave enough to undertake this journey before. Gilgamesh finds Urshanabi, pays him, and says, take me to the Garden of Immortality, and Urshanabi does it. Understandably, when they get there, Utnapishtim is annoyed. He says, welcome, I guess. What are you doing here? And Gilgamesh says, look at you. You're just laying around. There's nothing to do here. What did you do to earn immortality? Pishti tells Gilgamesh the great story of the flood and says, and so to sum up, I'm special. You're not. And Gilgamesh says, well, what do I have to do? And Pishti says, that's the point. You can cross this great body of water. You can do great deeds. But if you are made mortal and the gods do not change that, your mortality is your fate. And it doesn't matter how great you think you are. Gilgamesh is understandably disappointed. All of this for nothing. And Utnapishtim says, you've been a good sport. I'll give you a consolation prize. Out there in the waters, there is a plant. It grows deep beneath the waters. Wait yourself down. Take a walk and see if you can find it. If you can find this plant, it will make you young again. Take this plant back to your people and give them the gift of youth. Gilgamesh says, not bad, for second place. I'll do it. And he proceeds to tie immense rocks to his feet and he sinks below the surface of the waters. Now, this is interesting because it repeats a kind of creation myth that we find all over the world. In various creation myths, creatures are the ones who assist in the separation of elements so that the world can actually take form. It's a method of creation called earth diving. Usually, you have a series of animals who give it a try but fail. So you'll have beaver who will dive, but he can't make it anywhere. And he comes back to the surface and says, nothing solid. And another one of the water-going creatures, let's say turtle, says, let me give it a go. And the turtle dives down. Makes it further, but not quite. You get a whole series of animals, and eventually one of them actually locates something solid, grabs a big mouthful of it, and comes back to the surface. And lo and behold, when they get up there and they spit it out, it forms an island and grows. Presto, the world is now separate. What you have, the diving for the earth is what creates the separation. The waters are now different from everything else. In a weird kind of echo of that, Gilgamesh goes earth diving. And then he's looking for the herb of immortality. And yes, he finds it, plucks it from the earth beneath the waters and resurfaces with it. He's got it. Urshanabi takes him back to land, and Gilgamesh believes that everything is going to be fine. When I give this gift of youth to my people, I will be as a god. They will worship me like one, and we shall all be young again. They stop. 
They stop near a well. We'll come back to wells later. Out of that well, there comes water. It springs up from the earth. Water that comes up from beneath the earth has mystical qualities. There are wells all over Ireland, for instance, a completely different culture, and yet these wells are regarded as mystical things. They're holy wells, many of them dedicated to saints, but they've been there for thousands of years. They've been visited for thousands of years. People used to throw things in as sacrifices to the water spirits and goddesses. You ever thrown a coin in a well? You've tapped into an ancient ritual. Where do you think it comes from? A coin in a fountain? A coin in a wishing well? What one man into the water fountain? Sam, you're donating something to the spirits who guard that water. Water, life-giving element. They stop there to bathe and to drink and to sleep. And while they're asleep, out of the well comes a serpent. This will also be a story for The serpent crawls out of the well, slithers around the campsite, and discovers the plant. Delicious. The serpent gobbles down the plant and immediately sheds its skin and is as new. It has been revitalized, and it leaves its shell of a skin behind, brand spanking new, it slithers back into the well and vanishes. When Gilgamesh wakes up, he discovers the plant is gone. And mankind's immortality has been stolen by a serpent. What do I do, Gilgamesh says, and he comes to the realization that we all need to reach at some point. Our mortality is defined by what we can do on Earth for others, and that is the best that mortals can hope for. He goes home and says, it's not so bad. I built a city. I have a people that I have come to cherish and love. They shall remember me for these deeds, and that shall be the measure of my greatness. Water and mortality are linked in many of these myths. Let's go north. Northern Europe, far away from the Sumerians and the Mediterranean and the cradle of civilization, now we're in a cold, dark land where the Germanic peoples roam. They're great water goers, these people. They sail upon the seas in ships, shallow drafted, so that they can move quickly and skim the waves, no matter how bad they get. And on the prows of those ships, they place the heads of dragons. Why? Dragons can also be water creatures. We're used to finding them in caves and mountains and things like that. But we also know that dragons are a kind of serpent. And as we've seen, serpents also come from the water. The Germanic people sailed in these ships with their dragon prows to frighten away those who they could intimidate and subdue. And they would then land on shorelines and become earth goers again. The Germanic peoples knew that waters were places of mystery and adventure. They were places that you journeyed over in order to start new lives. Many of those Germanic tribes sailed over the seas from their Danish and German lands, and they found the island of Britain. We call them the Anglo-Saxons. They, too, had a heritage in common with Vikings and the Norsemen and they carried with them their great tales and myths. Among those myths were tales of a great tree. It's the axis of the universe. It has a funky name, Yggdrasil. But the Yggdrasil is the tree upon which the nine great worlds hang. 
And at its base are three holy wells. One of them is called the Urther's Well. This is the well that is guarded by the three wicked Norns. They're an ugly triple goddess. Urther, Verthani, and Skold. Urther is the embodiment of what became. Verdandi is the embodiment of what's becoming, and Skold is the embodiment of what is necessary to become. Past, present, future, and they guard the well of time. There is another well, Kvergogir, which appears in the deepest realm of Nibelheim. In that realm of cold and frozen water, Ice that steams and melts and refreezes almost before it can be liquid again. This particular well is where dwells a watery serpent named Nidog. Nidog spends its time gnawing at the roots of the universal tree. Eventually, it will lead its way through, and this will be one of the heralds of the end of the universe. And there is a third well full of the waters of wisdom, called Mimir's Well. This is guarded by the giant Mimir, and it is where one drink can give you the wisdom of the ages. Even the gods are tempted to drink from this well, and in fact, the greatest of them does drink. But just like any other well, just like the fountain where you threw a penny and made a wish, you must need something in Mimir's well equal to the wisdom that you gain or desire. When the great god Odin goes to drink from the well of Mimir, he must leave something of himself behind. If you find it, look for the eyeball, because that's where Odin left it. He must sacrifice the vision of one eye in order to gain the wisdom of the ages. And he calls that a fair trade. This is why Odin is the one-eyed wanderer who knows everything. Three great Norse wells at the heart of their mythology, at the base of their great tree. And they carry all of those stories with them when they cross the seas to conquer new lands. And their stories become the stories of the people that they conquer. One of those stories is the story of a great hero, a hero who also crosses the water in order to do great deeds. His name is Beowulf. In the Anglo-Saxon stories, the story of Beowulf is paramount. It is, in fact, the earliest story we have in the language you and I share and speak today. You and I speak English, but English is German. This is where its roots lie. You are speaking Anglo-Saxon many centuries removed from its original form. What we call Old English is a variant of German. That is the language that Beowulf is written in. We have the story of Beowulf in one single manuscript. Had that manuscript vanished, we wouldn't know the story of Beowulf. This is how delicate the survival of stories and literature can be. This manuscript contains the story of a great monster killer, a man who comes by water to save a people, a people who are beset by terrible monsters. The monster's name is Grendel, and he lives in a watery marsh from which he emerges to wreak havoc upon civilization. And the people can do nothing to stop him until the great Beowulf crosses those waters which divide in order to bring his assistance. In doing so, he must be tested by a Coast Guard, because when things can come from the water, you have to have someone guarding where the water meets the land. On that beach, the Coast Guard quizzes Beowulf and says, where do you come from, and what are you doing here? It's my job to ask these kinds of questions. And Beowulf says, you know the name of my father, and if you don't, you have no need of my name. I have come in order to save your people from the ravenous Grendel, and I have crossed the dangerous waters to do so. In essence, Beowulf is saying, I come from another world, and I've crossed the waters to enter yours. 
divisions shortened by journeys, crossing the waters in order to save others. Beowulf defeats Gretel. He defeats Gretel's mother, who lives in a cave under the waters. Beowulf, too, must dive beneath those waters in order to defeat that creature. Beowulf will do these great deeds. He will make a name for himself, and he, too, is on a quest for immortality. How do you achieve immortality amongst the Germanic peoples? Make sure they keep telling stories about you. Stories are the root to immortality. These stories will always be told, but he's always seeking more fame. Even when he's old, he's still looking for An old man, another monster, the third of three. He's defeated the ogre Brendel. He's defeated the underwater mother of that creature. And now he must fight a dragon, that most famous and most beloved of mythical creatures. This one has a great hoard of gold. And Beowulf wants the gold. Why? Gold's it. Put it away, let it sit for a while, come back and gloat over it. This is what dragons like to do, but it's what we like to do. And Beowulf says, let me do one more great deed to prove that I can. So he fights the dragon on the cliff sides next to the sea. He defeats the dragon, and the dragon deals him his mortal. And before he dies, he says, let the dragon's gold be buried in a mound with me. Build that mound on the cliffside so that all those traveling the waters may look upon it and say, there lies Beowulf, the doer of great deeds. And they shove the dragon's body out into the waters where it's claimed back into the deep where sea monsters tend to dwell. Beowulf is buried in his mound with his stolen treasure from the dragon. And there's an irony here. Because as they say their lamenting song over Beowulf at the end of that great poem, they say, here lies the man who did great deeds and who was most greedy for fame. That's the word they use in the Anglo-Saxon. Greed is not a good quality. And Beowulf's people have realized that despite the fact he's defeated the dragon, he has left behind no one to lead in his place. And this great mound that tells everyone here lies the great Beowulf is also like a beacon to all those waiting beyond the water for a weakness that they can exploit. And when they see that mound, they will say, there lies the great Beowulf. Let's go visit his people. Things cut both ways when you're looking for immortality and fame. Like water, it shifts, it's fluid. It's never quite what you think it's going to be. Let's move closer to our time period. Because myths get passed down through the ages. Water can be found in Germanic myths, in ancient Mediterranean myths. It can be found in the lands of the Celts, with their holy wells, and their stories of the ninth wave, the wave of transformation, the wave beyond which, if you travel, you may find the keys to the other world. You find water in the form of folk tales, in which rain falls and cleanses the earth and which gives rise to new plants and new living beings. Rain appears in fairy tales everywhere you look. One of my favorite fairy tales is in film form. One of the great modern filmmakers in terms of the fantastic. If you've never seen the film Pan's Labyrinth, it is a wonderful experience. But it's not a happy fairy tale, as most fairy tales. We're used to the happily ever after. We're used to the disney stories that we've seen. 
That is not Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's Labyrinth is a tale of a girl who is trapped within a horrible reality. She is the adopted daughter of a terrible fascist leader during the Spanish Civil War. And because she is trapped in this horrible reality, she continuously flees into a world of the imagination. She hides from the real world by inventing stories that she, in fact, is the princess, the daughter of the moon. The princess Moana. The moon is a feminine power, often tied to the tides of water. Therefore, as the waters wax and wane, so do the cycles of the moon, so do the powers of your heroine. Her name is Ophelia. But as the Princess Moana, she must complete great tasks. Like Beowulf slays three monsters, the Princess Moana must complete three great tasks. And she is continuously, during those tasks, washed by rain, a ritual cleansing after she has completed those tasks. Echoes of ancient stories thousands of years earlier Different cultures, different heroes. Ophelia's story ends tragically, and yet it also carries with it the possibility that all of these cleansings she's experienced actually tell us that she is an otherworldly princess, and that perhaps her end is not what we think it is. I would never want to ruin things for those who haven't seen it. But suffice it to say that the ending can be taken two ways. One hopeful and one tragic. They both exist at the same time, and it's worth considering. But what really excites me is that the maker of Pan's Labyrinth, a great teller of tales by the name of Guillermo del Toro, has a new film coming out this year, and it is Miranda. It is called The Shape of Water. And it is about a deaf woman who works in a lab in which they are keeping what they call the asset. What is the asset? It is a creature of the deep that they have captured and have taken to the lab in order to figure out what makes it tick. It is a merman. What is a merman? It is a roughly human being that lives below the waves in a formless, shapeless world. The merman is a breather of water. It's its element. And they want to weaponize him. The film takes place in 1962, on the edge of Cold War America. And what do they want? They want a being of the water that they can Control. This has interesting modern ramifications. Why? This is a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale with a fairy tale heroine and a fairy tale monster at the heart. It's also a love story between two beings from other worlds separated by water. These kinds of echoes of the mythical power of water come all the way up into the modern period. You find it in fantasy. You find it in fairy tales. You find it even in science fiction. Water is the key to the future. It's impossible to look around our modern world and not see the importance of water. It's impossible to live in Michigan and not know the power of water. We are surrounded on all sides by water. We know the destructive power of water. I was watching a live vidcam feed the other night of Grand Marais in the Upper Peninsula. Two-story waves of water on shore. The gales of November come early. <laughs> they can break a ship in half. They can wash you out to sea, or you can swim in it and have a 
lovely day at the beach. It's amazing that we can live surrounded by all of these lovely beaches and shorelines and water. We go out into it, we swim, we have fun, we have a great day at the beach, and every year there's another local story about somebody claimed by the waters. We look out at Lake Michigan and say, it is beautiful. And it is. And it's terrible. Water doesn't care about you. It can give. And it can take. And yet, we react to water in strikingly liminal ways. We feel its power. We listen to the waves. It takes us away and transports us. But we're always aware that there are those who might one day need our water. What will we do about it then? We've watched as water has destroyed cities. We've watched the hurricanes this year and recoiled at the power of nature. What normally is a gentle cleansing rain becomes a storm that can wipe a town off the map. We've seen what it can do, and we're powerless before it. Water fascinates. It draws us in. It repels us. It's formless, but it can take form. This is the power of water. Whether it's in my basement, or beyond the shoreline, or falling from the sky, water, water, everywhere. There are always drops to drink. John Keats thought his name would be written water, and that that would ensure being forgotten. Instead, we have a world in which stories are written in water. That is exactly why they are in You're, you're not my students, you're, you're, 
but you're not my slaves. You don't have to be my slaves. My students, unfortunately, have to be my slaves. Right now, there's a question. Other questions? Yes, please. I, I just kind of love it. Going to those places and those times that you just took us to. Um, and then thinking, can you do something with um, the open boat and seeing Crane in the water there and um, you know, not making it shore? We see oil that doesn't make it shore. The realization yeah. that while we're trying to get there, we could not have come this far. We have to be safe, but of course, going to be nature, the water doesn't. Absolutely. How many stories in which the, the actual story itself takes place on a boat, you've actually imposed upon the realm of water a very, very, what do you want to call it, tenuous solidity. So you have this little realm you can walk around on, but you're surrounded by water on all sides. You're intruding upon that world, I suppose. And so almost any story that features that, I think, echoes some of those things. You could certainly draw other parallels to great stories in which water itself becomes your antagonist, in a way. Hemingway's Old Man in the Sea, Moby Dick, essentially. These are all modern stories, Stephen Craig. These are modern stories, but the mythical power of water that appears in all of them goes all the way back. It's directly. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was in my mind, if I had had time, to touch on the 60s science fiction novel Dune, uh, in which you have an entire planet that's desert. And water, of course, is the most precious commodity in that world. And when you go in, there's very definitely a commentary going on there about the value of natural resources. Um, you know, there are other comments being made in that book. But, Water itself then becomes one of those things that Frank Herbert often said, I'm concerned about running out in the future. He said it in many interviews. Um, the entire story arose out of a study he did on dune ecosystems, in which everything has to be in balance for things to survive. And of course, there is water on that desert planet in dune, but it cannot be seen. It's actually a reverse of the mythical stories where the Earth is under the water. On Arrakis, the planet, the water is under the Earth. You actually have to water dive rather than Earth dive to find it. The problem is the ecosystem is so tenuous that any attempt to change it changes everything. And so water becomes a very mystical subject. If you're a desert people, Water is not just water. It is life. Nothing else matters, you see. And so the mythic power of that is carried over in very interesting science fiction ways. So modern stories are full of ancient mythical references. Other questions? Yes? The time frame of Gilgamesh. The time frame of Gilgamesh? I, I'm going to round it off because all we have are fragments of tablets scattered over a very long period of time. Um, our earliest fragments date back to between two and 3,000 BC, but even those fragments reference it as earlier. So a general, a general date given it is 4,000 BC. You're talking about 6,000 years ago, this story. And no other story ever found in any human language dates it. So it is, in fact, in many people's minds, the first story. It is the origin story of all literature, which is always fascinating. Yes? Um, in myths? Yes? How would you say that water is viewed differently than nature itself? Like just generally, or is it, is it similar? Uh, it is similar. It's part of nature, certainly. Uh, and in fact, it is in many respects um, it, it is from which all other nature derives, because if it's the primal element, if it is primordial, which simply means predating all else, then everything else natural arises out of it. So it's, it's no coincidence that almost every creation story then features the trifold division of sky, earth, and water. But it's out of water that earth appears and the separation of Earth from the rest of existence creates the sky. 
So you've got that kind of threefold division, and it's remarkable how almost every culture in the world has that exact same, has that exact same threefold division in it. The Celts had it, the Germanic peoples had it, the Mediterranean peoples had it, the Egyptians had it. There's your three, sky, earth, water. But water was always conceived of as the one from which everything else derived. So it underlies all nature imagery and all natural symbolism, I think. Did that make sense? Sometimes I don't. I, I just Anything else? Anybody else? Yes? Um, no, there's no way to get water in this as chaos. Yes, absolutely. Water is chaos, and in, in, many, in many of the ancient stories, uh, one of the prime antagonists of some of the earliest heroes are watery monsters, um, often dragon-y in nature. For instance, uh, in the great uh, Babylonian story about the hero Marduk, Marduk must defeat a goddess of the water named Tiamat, who appears as a many-headed dragon, and is in fact uh, the progenitor of the waters. Marduk must defeat Tiamat and tame the waters in order to control and bring order to the chaos that they represent. And so you're quite right. Uh, the chaos element of water actually, we, we actually see in modern echoes. Um, it's almost like water is sort of waiting and then never know when the storm comes and chaos results. It can happen with other elements, an earthquake and earth, a volcano and fire. But the hurricane, the flood, those natural disasters, that's always chaos being visited on order. And almost all ancient myths deal with that ultimate conflict, order and chaos, stability and formlessness. And water is always the Yeah, there's curvature. 
In other words, we get it. We've done the readings and we understand. We may not understand the global size of anything, but we know that we can keep going and we're wrapping around something. But it's true that there was always that mystery of what's beyond the waves. And most of the cultures believe that if you were sailing west, you would eventually hit the realm of the dead. I don't know why that is. It's always west. Maybe that's because that's where the sun sets, behind the waters over the horizon. But it was always towards the west that the realm of the souls was. And if you sail far enough, you might just get there. I don't know how I got there. What else? Anything else? Yes? Um, so, water is pretty important to people and everything, but yes. why, like, in the Neoheim, like, it's a hell of ice, but then Nibble the Neoheim, yes. Yeah, yeah. we usually, like, think of hell as, like, fiery and stuff, which is obviously the absence of water. So yes. The, the Norse did not have uh, a Christian concept of hell. Their underworld was completely separate from uh, any kind of judgy concepts that, um, say, the Christian hell evokes. They did have actually another realm that was sometimes referred to as hell. It's sort of an extension of Niflheim, and it's ruled over by a goddess named Hell, but it has nothing to do with the Christian hell at all, despite the similarity of name. It's H E L. But it's nothing like, it has nothing to, there's no correspondence there. Like, in, in fact, I don't know, is that movie coming out this weekend? What's the new Thor movie? Yeah, Thor Ragnarok, you know this is coming out. Any Marvel <coughs> superhero fans here, Thor fans? The big bad guy in that is played by Kate Blanchett. And it's hell. It's the Norse goddess of the dead, who's the big bad in that one. Um, so yes, the Christian hell is a fire but the Norse hell is a cold and frozen place. Yes. Anything else? I could go, I could talk for hours, <laughs> but you don't want me to, and I understand that. So if there are no other questions or answers, once again, thanks a lot for